current news magazine has an editorial lamenting the fact that American movies have suddenly become frank, adult, and dirty, and that the public morality is in danger. One of the several newspapers that I take every day is the New York Times. The Times rarely deals in sensation until you reach the entertainment page where the ads blare the wares of sex and violence at its readers. One of the ads this past week advertises a film in screaming black letters. It condemns all middle-aged status, sex and scotch, says the ad. Another film is advertised as outstanding irreverence, blackest of black humor. Sex will never be the same. Another film advertised in the New York Times says, irreverent romp that raises hell with everything sacred. And so the ads run enticing the public with their emphasis on sex, sadism, and violence. Sometimes a newspaper man or a student will ask me, what makes a movie dirty or immoral? Is it the frank dealing with immorality and lust? No, for if that were true, the Bible would be an undesirable book. In my opinion, a film, a book, or a play is immoral when it handles an unwholesome act or scene as though it were wholesome and desirable. The Bible takes a realistic attitude towards sin. It portrays incest, adultery, fornication, and perversion, but it goes to great lengths to portray the consequences of these sins. The Bible describes the mark which sin leaves on a man's soul and the torment of hell which haunts the one who insists on breaking the laws of God. It does not kid you into believing you can do wrong and get away with it. What if some night you saw on television a western in which the bad man won in the end? What if immorality persisted in made people happy? What if society had no curbs at all against what it knows to be wrong? This world would soon become chaotic. It would be a living hell. Today, the movies and television influence our young people more than the Sunday school or the church. If every child in America attended Sunday school one hour a week, from the time he was four until he was 14, he would have attended Sunday school only 540 hours. The television set is on in the average home five hours and 25 minutes a day. Children from the ages of four to 14 are the most avid viewers of television. The average child from the age of four to 14 will view more than 11,000 hours of television. And if he went to Sunday school every Sunday, he would be in Sunday school only 540 hours. One of our current popular magazines had a big spread about students at various universities throughout the country who are living together without being married. The sacred laws of God are not only being broken, but they're being laughed at. Students exhibit a raw frankness about sex and call it a sophisticated realism. They react violently against attempts by parents high school officials or university officials to make even suggestions as to what is moral or immoral. They express attitudes that back up what one is called an antinomian orgy of open-mindedness. In other words, the sex revolution among young people is now in full swing throughout the country. Whether we realize it or not, the Western world is already paying a fantastic price for this new permissiveness and freedom in the realm of sex. The number of illegitimate births has doubled in the past five years. In one of our cities with a population of less than a million, an average of 25 high school girls a day would drop this past year because of pregnancy. In spite of modern medicine, venereal disease is now at epidemic proportions throughout the nation. A newspaper article a few weeks ago reported that a new type of VD that does not respond to modern drugs is spreading throughout the country and girls are being severely warned by medical authorities against the indiscriminate use of the pill. Some medical authorities say that the evidence is piling up that the pill leads to certain types of cancer. Eighteen years ago, when I began preaching on the hour of decision, it would have been almost unthinkable for me to preach a sermon on such a subject. I now think that I was possibly wrong, along with other clergymen throughout the country. I believe it is high time that Christian leaders talk frankly and tell young people exactly what God expects of them. What does the Bible say about this all-important subject? I find that when I speak frankly on this subject in our crusades, 
Thousands of young people come and they listen and they respond to the challenge of living a clean, pure life with the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. This generation of young people learned about what is right and wrong in the realm of sex in the wrong places and in the wrong way. And now it's being talked about openly by secular, materialistic, and humanistic professors in the classroom who are telling them that their guilt feelings are from middle-aged Puritanism. A professor of sociology at Harvard University is deeply concerned and alarmed about the misuse of sex freedom in America. He has said that advocates of sex freedom have been launching a revolution in our journals, films, and television with the deliberate design to destroy what has been termed old-fashioned morals, which in reality are biblical morals. He also said that this campaign has produced a harvest of forced marriages, unwed mothers, wayward husbands, fleeing wives in a wave of juvenile and adult delinquency. The Bible teaches that sex is a gift from God, as I've said many times on this program. But like any other God-given gift, we're inclined to bend it and warp it for our own desires. Eating is a wholesome thing, but gluttony is wrong, the Bible says. Sex is a wholesome thing, but when it is not used discreetly and in the context for which God intended it, it can damage the body, the soul, the spirit, and the mind. Most of the magazines and journals quoting various sociologists, doctors, and psychiatrists indicate that the sex desire is not the real cause of sex commitment. They say it is the pressure toward conformity. A professor of the University of Illinois said recently, at best, sex is a ritualized pretense at lovemaking. Many sociologists and even some misled clergymen are saying that premarital sex is all right if it is an act of love, but many specialists in this field doubt that it can ever be an act of real love. And Judge Jenny Barron of the Massachusetts Superior Court says almost never the force driving a young man to break a girl down, girls must realize is not love. Rather, it is the craving for ego nurture. Even the nicest young man may be selfish. In my interviews with young people, one of the questions most often ask is about petting. There is no doubt that when two normal young people are together and alone, there is a strong physical attraction. And this is not wrong. It is as it should be. But the Bible teaches that the Christian young person will use restraint and self-control. Once a student asked me at a university, but if, if it is normal and God-ordained, why all the prohibitions? Now, you may be hungry, but you shouldn't go and break the window of a bakery to steal a loaf of bread as some are doing in some of our cities. You should buy it in the legal, proper manner. You may be thirsty for a soft drink, but you shouldn't break down the machine and steal it as some of our young people are doing. You may see a fur coat you just love, but that doesn't give you a license to own it before you pay for it. The Bible teaches that sex was made to be used in the confines of marriage for a purpose. Not only is God's law broken when you indulge in premarital sex, but there is ample evidence that premature and premarital sex inflicts deep psychic scars that you may carry all your life. It is not only in the interest of health, but also of happiness that the Bible teaches that immorality is a sin. This depersonalized, meaningless, and degrading pattern of courtship, as one educator has called it, can color and devastate your chance for happiness the rest of your life. Love is a basic need of all persons, but love and sex are two different things, although they certainly have relationships to each other. Marriages based on sex are in danger from the beginning. Marriage counselors all agree that sex is only one of the many ingredients in a happy marriage. If love were purely physical, it would terminate when physical beauty began to wane. That is why a happy marriage should not be based on animal attraction alone. We will not always be physically attractive, but attractive or not, the need for love, both giving and receiving it, will be with us as long as we live. If young people could learn to distinguish between real love and mere sex feelings, they would have learned one of the most valuable lessons of life. Sex is selfish. Real love is unselfish. Sex is for the moment. Genuine love is for keeps. Sex is physical. Genuine love is spiritual. The Bible says, And now abideth faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. 
Sex, apart from responsible love within the bonds of matrimony, creates guilt feelings. Genuine love gives you a sense of serenity and well-being. Anyone can participate in sex, even animals, but love is the highest of all human experiences. There are at least four reasons why God has said thou shalt not commit immorality. First, it is to protect your future marriage. If you commit immorality before marriage, it will affect your marriage later. Secondly, it is to protect your body. Thirdly, it is to protect you psychologically. Many students admit that they do feel guilty about committing immorality, which leads to emotional and psychological disturbances. They often feel insecure and unloved. Fourthly, God said, thou shalt not commit immorality in order to secure the foundations of society. The moral problem can threaten the very security of any nation. I'm convinced that Satan has a master plan to destroy the nations. His greatest plan is to get us so rotten at the core that we will collapse from the inside. And unless the moral trend in this country can be reversed, we are doomed as a cohesive society. Thus it was for our own good that God said, Thou shalt not commit immorality. No one can read the Bible without being convinced that immorality is one of the most grievous sins that we can commit before God. The Bible says the works of the flesh are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. The Bible says that the sin of immorality is a result of the deceitfulness of sin. But many ask, what is the remedy? What can we do? Is there any hope? Yes, I'm glad to tell you there is hope. There is hope for you who are held in the grip of immorality. You can have your sins forgiven. You can have a new power to face the temptations and problems of tomorrow. All of us are faced with this type of temptation, but none of us need to yield because the Bible indicates that Christ will give you the strength to resist the temptation. Today, if you're willing to give your life to Christ, God will forgive all the past, and he'll do far more than that. He will give you the strength to face tomorrow. I pray today that you will receive Christ. Let him give you supernatural power to face the temptations of today and tomorrow and the days ahead. You can receive him now. Repent of your sin and receive him as your Lord and Savior. Make that commitment and enter a new dimension of dynamic living. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank thee and praise thee for a gospel that announces that every sin of the past can be forgiven and that there is power to face temptation tomorrow. We pray that many this day will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, for we ask it in his name. Amen.